So I think it's time uh, we'll go ahead and get started and let any latecomers jump in. So uh, like I said, uh, we have Aldous and Phil on with me today as well. So I'm going to start us off with Aldous um, and just asking, uh, just let's start basic and what is ReCircle? Thanks, Caroline. Welcome everybody to our ReCircle Recycling webinar. Um, it's fantastic to think that uh, we are covering the globe uh, because this is a global issue and a global problem which needs to be solved and uh, we think we have a pathway and a solution for the world. So what is uh, ReCircle? ReCircle is a closed loop recycling appliance uh, for homes and businesses. Um, or alternative, it's a closed loop, re it's closed loop recycling equipment for industry and organisations. We use the word closed loop often simply because recycling has many, many meanings. And the one that's important for the world is closed loop recycling. So, and closed loop recycling is very simple. It is basically taking one of your used bottles and making it into a new bottle. Um, the co very simple concept is take what's used, process it so it can be made into a new bottle. Great. Uh, so that was a really helpful overview of all this. Um, but I, I, it would be nice to know, kind of get uh, a bit uh, more information on exactly what problem this uh, system is solving and why do we need it? The problem we are solving is a very simple one. It's pollution of our environment. The current consumer society is a linear, single material use system. At both the start and the end of the consumer process, we pollute the environment. Iron ore, bauxite, oil, gas, sand, limestone, etc., etc., must all be mined or extracted. And these processes are very energy intensive and are high in CO2 equivalent emissions. At the end of the consumption process, we throw away our used materials and a small amount ends up in the oceans. We think there's a lot in there, but only a small amount ends up there. And you can see what sort of a mess we're making when there is so much in there and that's only a small amount. The rest end up, ends up in waste mountains. We are building all over the world or it is incinerated, um, which is much more polluting than burning of coal. To fix both ends of our consumption process, we must close loop recycle. Closed loop recycling does away with mining and extraction and also throwing away of the used materials after use. Under existing recycling systems, between 2 and 10% of the world's used materials are recycled. And I use that word recycle in a very general sense. In the UK, for example, where I'm sitting here, and it'll apply um, in most parts of the world, some of them are better than others, uh, less than 2% of what could be closed loop recycle, consumer closed loop recycle, is actually closed loop recycle. Um, we don't know those figures for sure. They're very hard to find. Um, so it might be three, it might be one. But anyway, it's somewhere in that order of magnitude. So the simple reason why we need a circular economy is so that we don't pollute the environment, so we don't kill off animals and insects and species at the most rapid rate in history, or continue to do that, and hopefully allow our grandchildren to live on this planet. So how, um, so how will ReCircle actually address this problem that we have with recycling? The existing recycling systems fail very simply because we don't get high enough purity of the substance out at the end of the recycling system. We can get it, except in some cases the steps are so expensive that it's just financially not viable to do. And this is the main problem um, that we face. So we must produce purity of recycled or used materials as soon as possible, as practical as possible, um, so that they can be virtually input directly into the manufacturing process. So only if that occurs will we close loop recycle and only if that occurs will we um, solve uh, the problem that we have. The recircle recycling system achieves that. We will produce 
at the resale appliance or at the equipment, closed loop recyclable uh, products. And these products would be able to go directly as manufacturing inputs. So that's very simple what, what we're trying to do. And we do that, we ensure purity by we never allow the system to put to use materials of different substances together. Okay, so then how as, um, as a user, somebody that has this appliance, then how, uh, so I understand the theory of it, but how does it actually work? Uh, the use of the appliance is very similar to your existing dishwasher or washing machine. Um, I think most households have washing machines. Quite a lot of households don't have dishwashers. But so it's a very simple process. You load it up, you put your used materials into dedicated substance bays. So the difference between what how you will load up this unit as opposed to your washing machine or your dishwasher is that you'll have dedicated bays. Uh, when you load it up, you will close the drawer. Um, you will have put in some detergent and you will press the start button and the machine will then go through and do its process. So for a user, that's all they have to do. They do not have to unload like a dishwasher or a washing machine. They do not have to unload the system every time they use it. They only unload it between three and eight times a year when the material containers or the product containers are at the bottom of the unit and one of them is full. Okay, great. Uh, and I just saw that, yeah, David, we can show you a, a rendering of the appliance um, in the Q&A section to help kind of help uh, visualize what, what it will really look like and how we think it will work. Uh, so then, okay, so you've got the machine, you've, you've put your recycled materials in, it is then stored in the machine, it's there, it's done. Uh, but then what happens after that? So what are the logistics of once it's the machine's been used in the house, what happens after that? Okay, uh, once the machine has been used in the house and one of your containers is full, you will disengage the bottom third of this unit, which is effectively look like your pot drawer, and you will put that down by the curb or an agreed place. It will then place either on the curb or somewhere which has been agreed between you, the household, or you, the business, and the system. You will then basically, those materials will then be unloaded into a vehicle separately, and then those materials, depending on where we where you are geographically, some will be able to go direct to remanu uh, to manufacturing sites, or in, uh, where those don't exist in the locality, there will be a bulk transfer station which will collect all these materials, and then they will be bulk transported by either train or rail to uh, wherever the manufacturers happen, the closest manufacturers happen to be. Okay, great. And um, so I guess my, my next question is actually going to be for Phil. So if I'm going to maximize you on this. Uh, so Phil, what do you see? What is the most difficult aspect of developing the prototype? Well, obviously we're not um, a multinational organization. So the, the we don't have the unlimited financial or manpower resources that um, these organizations do have. But what we do have is a robust and realistic plan um, and a very strong core team, um, all of whom have a proven tra track record um, developing R&D innovative products. Um, and one of the advantages with a, with a small team like this um, is with a singular focus, um, we can actually, I believe, develop this as quickly as a large multinational could. Um, we're not being pulled onto multiple projects and we're not having to deal with the general bureaucracy that, um, that is faced in a large organisation. Now, from an actual development standpoint, um, two of the biggest challenges we face is one, moving all the materials, um, a wide range of materials through the appliance from start to finish when the user loads it into the storage unit at the end um, and also the granulation systems. Um, that we need to process the glass, the plastic, the, the aluminium and tin. Um, now, the first, moving the materials through the appliance is, is pretty much uh, an exercise in good mechanical design practices and innovative solutions, which, as I say, we have a proven track record of this. 
Um, and the second, the granulation system requires an expert in the field. Um, and we do have um, Gilles Poltinger on board um, who developed these, these things, these centric granulators for a company called Nuga for, for six years. Um, he was the head of their technical development and design. So, so I'm confident that we have the, the team in place to deliver this. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Phil. Uh, so um, I think I'm going to switch this back to, uh, to over to Aldis. So what are the initial rollout plans and why have you chosen to roll it out in this way? Uh, the initial rollout plans are for, we have found a dedicated location in California around one of the major cities. And the reason why we have selected um, this location is there's a number of reasons. First of all, uh, the benefits that this uh, unit provides, one is an environmental benefit. Okay, It does all the other benefits like convenience and time saving, um, and it will eventually find you financial benefits as well. However, the environmental benefits have to be uh, recognised, and so we need to be in an area which is uh, sympathetic to, uh, where people are sympathetic to the environment. And for instance, California has had a bottle deposit system since 1987. Um, the country that I come from has had it in one state since in the middle 2000s. Um, the UK, where we're sitting now, doesn't. Um, so the other reasons is that the, in California there are existing subsidies for high quality recycled products. The average spend by households annually every year on new household appliances is very high. Um, so we will just be asking uh, householders to postpone a replacement of their existing appliances to purchase one of uh, a domestic uh, recycling appliance or our recycle. They don't have any space limitations in their kitchens. Um, and they're early technology adopters. There are other logistic reasons as well. The site that we picked is, um, is, has, has fantastic access from a number of freeways and streets and so forth and so on. So they're the main reasons why we have decided to uh, roll out the first applications in California. Okay, great. Uh, and so in terms of, of where we are then in that process, so what has been done uh, so far? Okay, um, what has been done so far is first of all, we have uh, filed international patents and they exist in the US, Canada, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, China. We have pen patents pending in India and the EU. It's interesting to know that we started these applications in 2009 and in the EU and India, they're still pending, but they, uh, it all looks pretty, they sh there shouldn't be any problems, it's just time. Um, they've got through all the other countries, so there shouldn't be any problem in India and, and, and Europe. Um, we have done the appliance pre-designed layout, and we have completed supporting internal schematics. Um, and we have, as Phil mentioned, we have a highly experienced technical team ready to start work um, at the end of this month. Okay, so we've got the team, uh, we've got the patents, so then, um very briefly, then what are you then raising the funds for now on this uh, CrowdCube campaign? Okay, on this CrowdCube campaign, we are trying to raise funds to develop um, a number of components. And these include sensors, grinders, granulators, compactors, wash cycles, internal materials handling, as Phil mentioned, um, product storage containers, product pickup trailer, electronics controls, appliance body, and so forth. So you can see there's quite a few components that we have to develop specifically for this unit. In all those pieces, all those components, there's not one piece of new technology. We all have, what we have to do is have to re-engineer to suit our design appliance. Um, we'd also like to do some work on the circular economy. We want to start right from scratch so that the designs of this appliance will be as easily demanufactured at the end of life as they are manufactured at the start of life. We want to do a life cycle assessment to get the finance, the, the environmental benefits um, more accurate than what we have already. We've already done one calculation, which is probably the first order of magnitude. We'd like to improve upon that. We definitely are, have identified new patents we'd like to apply for to extend the uh, protection, the marketing protection for, for another 20 years. Um, of course, we then like to prepare commercialization, uh, business plans and funding plans 
um, for our for the next stage uh, for the commercialization stage and finally we will need to spend a little bit of money on project management and administration putting all those bits and pieces together there's approximately 13 items and each one of those items on average will cost somewhere in the order of around um, 100,000 pounds plus or minus depending on which component we're talking about Okay, uh, and that's actually good. I, I just wanted to um, loop back around again, uh, just in terms of looking at the kind of commercialization point. Uh, so can you just, again, go over briefly um, what the idea is, what, what are the main revenue streams that you see with the product and what is the plan after the initial California launch? Okay, the planned revenue streams are very simple. There is a, an appliance or a box moving business box selling business just like a any appliance so that's one form of revenue the second revenue will be the sale of the uh, the products which are produced we have named these products reproduct um, and we have trademarked them which is so um and we and we have trademarked things like reproduct glass reproduct plastics and so forth and so on um so um the, as it turns out that after a rollout of, of our, from our estimated calculations so far, that within 10 years and a rollout of between three and 4,000 units, appliances, the products business or the reproducts business is a bigger business on an annual basis than the sale of appliances. Um, so have I asked all the questions, Carol, answered all the questions? Is there one of the part that I haven't answered? And after California. Oh, sorry, after California, my apologies. Quite clearly, we'll be rolling out into other um, major cities in California, and then yes. we will go into the US. Uh, we will select, there are 11 states in the United States which already have bottle bill uh, systems or bottle deposit systems. So we will prioritize those. And then eventually we will go out to the 300 odd plus uh, cities, uh, large and small around the United States. After the United States, quite clearly, there's the Western world. Um, UK, Europe, um, Japan, Korea, and then of course uh, the main play, which will be China, um, India, and then the, and the other subcontinent countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh and so forth. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All this. Uh, so I am going to uh, go into the Q and A uh, session now. So thank you all for sending through some really great questions coming through in the chat box. Um, we've also got some others, obviously a, a big discussion on a lot of these um, points in our Crowdcube page as well. Um, but we're going to start just going through, I'm just going to go through uh, in order uh, that these questions are submitted. And if we feel like we can just give a bit more color on them, uh, we will. And uh, I guess, yeah, with Aldous and Phil, you know, jump in, whoever wants to grab um, the question. Uh, it's up for grabs. Uh, whoever gets there fastest. Uh, so I'm going to start with Grant's question, which was, um, how can I get involved in Australia? Uh, Grant, the best way that you can get involved is straight after the end of this uh, webinar. If you would send me an email with a very short description of what you, what you who you are and what you can do, I will then respond to you in person and we will try to see where we can uh fit you in. Um, basically our major work uh, we'll be doing in different parts of the world and this development process because we've got fantastic people and it's not worthwhile to bring them all into one spot. Um, so yes, Australia is one spot where we'll be doing some work. Fantastic. Uh, and um, so the next one is uh, David asked if you could see an example uh, of the appliance. Um, so well, we've got David. So we we have some renderings of of the um, of the product that we can show, uh, and that I can send. I'm going to put a link into uh, that video in the chat box now, as all this is just going to do a brief chat through that while I. Okay. So what was his name? My apologies. David. David. Sorry. My apologies, David. Hello, David. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, the we, we are in a pre-prototype stage, so I'm sorry we cannot give you anything physical to look at, which is the whole point of what we're trying to raise the funds for. Um, however, we have uh, produced some um, diagrams um, which and, and uh, some graphics, which Carolina has mentioned she's going, to, she's going to put up. 
If you want to see things in detail, um, that's, there's no problem about doing that, except we'll have to um, sign NDAs uh, or non-disclosure agreements or um, confidentiality agreements. Uh, once again, and if you send me an email at the end of this uh, seminar indicating a direct desire to have a look at things, we can um, get that process rolling. So, guys, trying to find that uh, animation video. Um, I will keep looking for that, David. Uh, so, the next question from Amri. Uh, so, how much energy will this appliance consume compared to an appliance like a dishwasher? Okay. Um, we have done um, a, it's a very interesting question that you ask. We have done a life, well, Phil has done a life cycle assessment of uh, of various appliances and also this appliance as best we can. And what it looks like to us is that this stage is suggesting that the energy requirement of this appliance will be comparable to what your dishwasher is. It will be less than your washing machine and your dishwasher. Of course, it depends on how often you will use it. We initial thoughts are that you will use this appliance, we think, between half and two thirds of the amount of time that you would use your dishwasher. Um, so from that perspective, from an energy usage consumption point of view, the, we, we think it's gonna be approximately about the same as your, as your dishwasher. Um, as you will be well aware, your dishwasher um, is less than your washing machine probably, and also the amount of energy that you use of your, wash, uh, dish, of your washing machine is dramatically less than your fridge. The, um, benefit that comes from this unit is that the products that are produced, when they are, when you create new bottles or new materials, the amount of energy required and the amount of equipment emissions created is approximately half, plus or minus, but approximately half what the virgin materials create. So you can, so in simple terms, effectively, what this appliance will do in your home is after the cost of the electricity and the detergent and this and that, um, and the water and so forth, it will, it will effectively make your fridge um, CO2 emissions uh, zero. So if you, the amount that your fridge produces, now subtract what your recircle appliance will um, save, and you'll end up having a fridge which is producing effectively zero emissions. Okay, great. Sounds good. Uh, so the next question is from Thomas. Uh, Thomas asks, how much does one of these machines cost or will one of these machines cost, I guess? Thomas, that's a question which everybody asks um, straight away, especially the males. Um, so, and, and quite clearly, it's, uh, it's a question which we have a lot of difficulty of answering. We do not know the final components that will make up this appliance. We are very confident that whichever way we look at it, it will be an affordable piece of equipment in the place that we first roll out. So in California, we consider that the cost of building the appliance and so forth will be competitive with a high-end uh, dishwasher uh, washing machine. So that's what we think the purchase price is gonna be. So my first question, I don't know for sure. However, the second point is, that this is not just a purchase of an appliance, this is going to be a value proposition to you. Not only will it deliver to you the benefits of time saving and convenience, it will deliver an environmental benefit. Now, my guess is I don't exactly know what that is to everybody. It's obviously more to some than to others. However, eventually, and we won't be able to do it in the early years, but we think after sort of about approximately year five of the first rollout, that we will start to be returning um, cash value to the users of appliance for the, the products that they produce in return for what they have done. How quickly we can get those return prices to a level where there is a sensible financial return on investments to satisfy all the angels and VCs and, and investment people, um, uh, I don't you know, know exactly when that will be. But my guess is that we would like to think that before 10 years out that this unit will be better than buying a Barclays share um, in the UK um, or some other share somewhere else, but it might be quite as good as Apple or, or Google. Um, 
The value proposition also includes, uh, for instance, the bottle deposit system returns. At the moment, where most places where they are, you have to keep a separate container for your uh, for the bottle deposits which comply with the systems, and they are obviously are different in virtually every state. Um, so you have to know what you're doing. Anyway, you keep a separate uh, bag of these stuff, and then you probably put them in the boot, or get on the train, or get on the bus, and you go to a recycle processing centre. And you then stand in the queue and you get out your nine pounds or your nine dollars, whatever it might be, for your 90 or 100, 200, whatever number of containers that you've had in your bag. And then you quietly get back in the car, the train, the bus and go home. Uh, this unit will be able to process those bottle deposits while you're sitting in your kitchen. So these are sort of benefits that we feel um, are quite difficult to to quantify it at this stage. So um, that's why I, I, I don't just give an answer on what is the price at this stage. So I hope you'll understand. Thanks, Aldous, that makes sense. Uh, so the next one, uh, I'm not sure if maybe Phil, you might want to take this one. Uh, how is the risk of user error addressed? So for example, users placing materials in the wrong input drawer or container, presumably that risk contaminating the entire output. Uh, so, Phil, I don't know, are you happy to take that one? Yep, sure. Um, so this is one of the problems with the current recycling system, whether it's a, a co-mingled or a, or a multi-stream system is relying on the user to correctly segregate the materials, as it's the, the uh, question says they're, they're not always clearly labelled. So what we have in place is a, is a combination of um, different sensors, a sensor array, um, one is using near infrared spectrography, um, which will analyze the material type. Um, that is already in miniaturized form, commercially available. Um, we also have some, some people interested in working with us who are developing low cost versions of that, um, technology. Um, and that will be coupled with some form of optical sensor. So we can then look for things like neck rings, caps, um, full films on bottles, all of those items that potentially contaminate the material stream um, will be identified, segregated or flagged back to the consumer, um, the user, um, as an issue that needs to be corrected. So it's taking the human error out of the system. Great, fantastic. Um, so I think as well that is, um, I, I hope, Anouk, that, that I think should answer your um, question about the materials being labeled. Uh, give us a, a shout in the chat if you have further questions on that and how that works in the machine. Uh, I'm going to move on to Kieran's question, uh, which is, will there, um, uh, maybe we can just uh, expand on this. I think Aldous just touched a little bit on this on his last answer. But will there be a buyback process in place from the materials to help incentivize customers? Uh, so what I, sorry, my apologies for the technical issues there. Very simply that uh, the answer is yes to the question. The question is how soon? Uh, of course, we'd like to do it straight away, but that's going to depend on the volume of the, of the products and the price that we can get for them. Um, we think that's going to take some time to develop um, uh, and to give us in a position that we will get the prices and the volumes to the stage where there is value so that you can be paid cash for your recycled material. However, in the first, from the very first person who purchased one of these appliances, we will provide them with a free pickup system. Our indications are that the cost of that pickup will be less than the sale of the materials that will be in the uh, storage container. So we are confident that we will be able to provide a free pickup service. That will be the first free pickup service for any recycling, I think, in the world. Um, which everybody knows already that they pay for their recycling service. Um, and they don't have this sort of a compulsory in most cases. In some places in California, that's another reason why California, just very quickly why on that subject, is that California, a lot of places in the United States, you, you can not take up a recycling service. So you can um, save yourself at the moment, a recycling service in some cities is in the order of 250 US dollars a year and you will be able to discontinue that service and save yourself the 250, at least knowing that whatever you put in your recycling unit will be 100% closed-loop recycled. So the point is, 
five five years we think is what we're going to aim for. We'd love to think it was going to be year one. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be that. We'd love to get it earlier than five, but let's just say five, six, seven, somewhere in that sort order of magnitude to start getting new payments back in cash for your closed loop recyclable products. Great, thanks. Uh, I've got another question from Anouk. So it's, uh, is the aim to include a step of chemical recycling in the device or is it only granulating? It, um, no, it is purely mechanical recycling. Um, we, the chemical processes are far too complicated uh, to put in a domestic um, recycling appliance. The chemical uh, recycling processes are interesting. We are at the moment, we're aware of about 60 of these processes being developed by all sorts of people. Phil's keeping a very close uh, watch on, on the more, on the leading ones. They're very interesting in a way, and one would like to be fantastic if they worked. They're possibly going to work. How they're going to be financially viable, we I have a lot of difficulty in working that out because they effectively have got to compete with, they're going to produce materials which are effectively a barrel of oil. Um, so they have to compete with the price of a barrel of oil after um, going through all their processes, which is quite complicated technology. The other thing which is a problem with the chemical recycling that um, I see is that one, it assumes that they're going to get all the material for free, and secondly, that the quality of the used material, the, the performance of these, pro of these processes, depends very much on the quality of the material that goes into them. And so how they're going to get a relatively pure stream of plastics is quite an interesting question, and how much will they get? So they're going to need a system, a separate system, we think, to collect plastics so that you can put it in their chemical recycling process. And I just, unless the government comes on board and provides substantial subsidies, far higher than what exists today, and far higher than Chancellor Hammond met, uh, sort of announced last year in October, I see there's, there's a long way for these chemical recycling systems to go. Okay, great. Uh, so I think this is a, a quick one for Kieran. I think it might be good to just highlight this. Again, so uh, what are the intervals are we foreseeing for consumers uh, in terms of like how often will they need to clear out that final third collection drawer on average? Okay, so um, this is, sorry, Aldous. Um, this is the emptying of the um, storage unit at the bottom. Um, so what we've done initially is review um, a lot of council bin audits, um, riveting stuff. Um, and break down the annual household waste for our demographic, um, apply compaction rates to that, and and come up with an initial estimate of how si how size how large each bay needs to be for all of them to fill at a regular rate. Um, based on that those estimations and that um, information, we say around about once every other month you would need to empty this. So around about six times a year. Great, thanks for that. Um, so uh, Anouk's got a question. I think Anouk Aldous might have covered this in his previous answer about um, transporting the materials to manufacturers, um, receiving money back. Uh, if there's anything uh, that you'd like him to go deeper into on that subject, if you wouldn't mind just um, putting that in the chat box for me again, if you feel like you need a little bit more on that, but I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and move past that if that's all right. Uh, the next question I have from David is uh, the working of the recycle recycling process will be dependent on local collection systems. Uh, so how do we get local authorities to buy into the system? So again, I, I think that all this is answered that in terms of how the collection would work, that it would actually be part of the recircle and it would be a, a thing that would, obviously in the States, it's an opt out system, uh, but I'm gonna pass it over to him real quick. Okay, uh, we because we have to keep all the materials separate and we cannot risk any contamination, from the moment you close your drawer on your uh, domestic recycling appliance and press the start button, we can't allow humans to ever touch that stuff again until it goes into a manufacturing process. So we will have a dedicated pickup system um, because we have to be able to pick up uh, six, seven, eight, nine, depending on how many materials uh, we're going to pick up. So that's a dedicated system. The great thing about dedicated systems today is that we can thank you know, companies like Uber and Amazon, who have developed the logistics behind on-demand uh, pickups 
from households. Um, so we'll be able to utilise that system. Our pickup system will effectively be a trailer, so it won't be one of these big trucks that you see driving around the, around the countryside. It'll effectively be a trailer. It'll look like a horse float to a degree, um, and so anybody who's got an SUV or a sort of truck or something will be able to tow one of these trailers. Whoever, whoever can pull a horse float with their car will be able to effectively hook up and become a provider of our pickup service. So we have a very simple, relatively light, uh, trailer to, that will be our pickup system, which will then deliver either directly to manufacturers or to the bulk uh, transfer station. Great, thanks, all this. Um, next, uh, Grant, Grant is going to be in London, so Grant can buy us all a drink uh, on the seventeenth of June. Uh, but no, Grant, I think uh, if probably just if you could email all this um, directly, and he'll he'll uh, chat to you yeah, about please. that. Uh, great. So I'm going to move on to uh, Sebastian's question. So uh, can it be connected to a smart meter so it runs and uses energy when it's cheapest during the 24 hours surplus energy produced? I can't see any reason why we won't have this as one of the Internet of Things so it can be connected to any smart meter. Phil, is there any reason why we can't do it? Not at all. As long as if you're happy running your washing machine and your dishwasher at night, then why not? Great, fantastic. Uh, I love that answer. Uh, so we've got another next question from Grant. So in the near future, is it possible that this unit can be manufactured on a size that may interest local body councils that currently collect through units or council resource recovery centers? We would like to get these units out um, wherever we can, as soon as we can. My experience to date has been that in trying to get them to any place of scale, which is an industry or a company or councils or you name it, um, because we can't confirm a, re a financial return on investment, these guys, and I don't blame them, these industries and so forth, will, do not want to take the hit on developing the, the prototype. Um, so my guess is once we've got a prototype, we'll be able to start talking to these people and we'll, we'll be able to approach them um, and try to, uh, to deliver these units to all the other places like hospitals, building sites, you name it. Wherever, wherever humans make the decision to create waste by putting two pieces of separate materials together is a site for where a recircle um, appliance or equipment um, can go. So very simply, just on the concept of trying to take these big, uh, we understand that everybody understands the world of scale. Unfortunately, the most important part by so many factors is purity. And if we don't live a purity, there is no re closed loop recycling. So number one, two, three, four, whatever number of priority you like to put it, we have to have purity there. Then can come scale. And if that can work, well, then great. The only trouble is, the biggest scale, so you'd think, if, so if scale is the answer, you'd think that the existing system should work efficiently, brilliantly, and closed loop recycle. I'd love to say it does, but it doesn't. So you can quite clearly see that at this stage, the scale solutions are very difficult indeed. What we have to do, as I keep saying, is purity. Purity delivers cash value. Purity also delivers environmental values, and if you want those two things to be sustainable and deliver closed loop, you must hit purity. So that's the whole concept of scale sounds great, but please let me tell you the factors in purity are multiple times higher than what you achieve by increasing scale. Like if you increase savings of, say, 30 40 50% by scaling something up by two or three times in volume, I can guarantee by doing the sales scale, by getting purity up, up front, the increase is closer to 5, 10, 15 times improvements. So the factors that are delivered by, by purity are dramatically higher than the factors produced by scale. Uh, that actually, I think, leads quite nicely onto uh, Anouk's question um, or point, which is, you know, she said, uh, so low material recovery rates are to a great extent due to low collection rates. Although much research exists on recycling behavior and incentives, a challenge remains to engage consumers with recycling and take back systems as volume is very significant. Uh, and so I think this is what you're talking about in terms of hitting that, um, changing the behaviors 
early on instead of uh, relying on scale. Uh, so as volume is very significant, I wonder how Recircle aims to address this issue. As I just said, we are very confident that so long as we hit purity, and we think we will, because we are going to make sure that you don't put two materials of different substances together in the one place. And if you do do that, then the dear old recircle machine is going to say, no, thank you. You are going to have to get it right, but it shouldn't be very difficult, we don't think. Um, so the actual behaviour change, which is I think is an amazing and important uh, issue. First of all, we'd like to think that what we're going to ask individuals and businesses to do is to not change their behaviour, but to use exactly the same behaviour that they currently use with their worn clothes every day or with their dirty dishes and their pots and pans every night with their dishwasher. All we want to do is to extend that behaviour to their used materials, so their beautiful, used, beautiful, valuable used materials, so long as we give them the wherewithal to keep them separate, which is what we plan to do. So that's what the, the recircle is going to do. The other point about the issue of behaviour is quite an interesting one. The, the, the bulk system at the moment has a big push by councils all the way around the world and everywhere in the industry to try to educate us to do the right thing. Let's just assume that somewhere like the UK and the US, everywhere had exactly the same system and everything was exactly the same. So there weren't any confusions between Scotland and Wales and, and London or between Chicago, Los Angeles um, and San Francisco. If, that, if the whole world was exactly the same, I would think they'd be, hard, be unlikely to be much of an improvement. And the reason is we're human. I don't know about you guys, but I know, I don't drink anymore. I, had, I gave up some years ago, but I can tell you that after dinner, I cannot believe that if I didn't have something to tell me to put something in the right place, that I'd always get it correct. In fact, you won't. And if you think of human nature and human behaviour, in nearly every country in the world today, if you drink and drive, you get huge penalties. And the consequences are not just the penalties and you're losing your licence, you can kill someone. But still, we do it. We do exactly the same thing with speeding. We have signs up everywhere to speed, but everybody, well, I definitely do, and I know I'm not meant to, but I do, despite the fact that I know that if I make a mistake, I could kill someone, and still I speed. So what is the incentive for you and me and everybody else to put the right thing in the right bin? We'd all like to do it but we're human and we won't. So what we need is something which ensures that we're all good little boys and girls and we all do the right thing. And that means that if you put a PET bottle in a glass container in your recircle, the recircle is going to say, sorry, don't like that. Please, can you fix it? Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much, guys. That was a really, um, really great questions, uh, fantastic questions. Um, I think we're we're closing up now. Um, Phil, is there anything else that's come out of that um, question session that you'd like to speak on, or anything else you'd like to say? Um, just one point on that on that last question. Um, low material recovery rates are to a great extent due to low collection rates. Um, the global governments are actually touting that collection rates are going up, and they are, um, but the problem is what they're collecting. So the low recovery rates are to a greater extent due to the single stream commingled system, which is introducing a high degree of contamination, and that's what impacts the, the recovery rates out of those material streams. Where they have separated sources, they have a higher they have a higher recycling rate, but it's still got a long way to go. Right, I guess that and that kind of ties back into Aldous's point about the purity uh, being the key. Um, so I'm just gonna Aldous, before I have you to give any closing uh, things, I'm just gonna pop in this last question from Kieran. Uh, so he's we're really interested. Uh, on your thoughts on how consumers will firstly adopt and perceive the Recircle product and concept. Kieran, um, to be completely utterly honest, I'd love to know the clear and answer that. However, I have now basically been looking at this, developing this uh, lines for some years. And the thing that never ceases to amaze me is the interest that various people have in having one of these units. Um, so that has the reason why uh, 
we are still trying to do it because I get positive feedback of people wanting one of these units. What we've got to do is somehow to give them one, which is what we're trying to achieve now. So very simply, I don't think there's going to be any problem with people. My gut feeling is, and I'm no marketeer, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not in that world of, I'm an elite. I think that we're going to protect, we're going to uh, select specific areas, which is going to be enhances the chances of being being not too expensive for people. But within three years of these things operating, we know that they will then start to um, be in the case where they'll be able to be leased or higher purchased, so the upfront price will go down. As every year goes on, like we don't think we'll be coming here in the UK until we've got a very strong um, cashback model uh, because we know that a lot of the households here will require, um, there's not a lot of spare room in most UK kitchens, for example, um, which we think is going to, which will be definitely a, a negative problem. However, it's interesting to know um, that I've got quite a few friends who, when they refit their kitchens, the amount of space they have for all their different bins these days is quite surprising. Um, so what are people are people going to buy these things? I think they're going to buy them once they realize it's a convenience, it's nothing more than a dishwasher or a washing machine. They've got plenty of those things already. They pay a lot of money for them. All the people that we're going to go to in the United States initially in the first sort of three or four years will have all purchased a, purchased a fridge, which will be approximately double the cash price of this unit, what we think roughly going to be, you know, the sort of order of magnitude. Um, so we don't think that's going to be a problem. The biggest problem is obviously going to get out to everybody's home. Um, and that's an issue which is going to be a purely a function of us being able to uh, deliver value to the return material, to the materials, that are, the products that are produced, and the quicker uh, and the faster we can get that up so that making these units viable, what would be great is that eventually, and not in the too distant future, like I'd be like to think before the first 10 years rollout, that we'd be in a position to offer a model where we would provide these units as a service fee only um, and also a pickup cost because um, it's obviously the pickup costs are important, but so we want to incentivize people not to have many pickups. Um, so if we could give them a service agreement only and a pickup cost, and then we just take the materials from them, the products from them, then that is a, a model which allows virtually everybody all over the world to have one of these units. So that we like to think that within 10 years, there shouldn't be one household anywhere in the world that would not be able to afford paying a service fee for one of these appliances. Okay, thanks. Um, and I'll just, I guess, I'll just uh, pass over to you for any final comments before we close it up. Uh, first of all, can I thank everybody for their time? Um, thank you for listening um, to me going on. Um, very much appreciate your time. And please, if anybody's got any questions, I'm absolutely delighted to receive emails, questions, or you put them on the uh, crowdfunding site. Pick up the phone. Um, I'm here. That's, I've been spending quite a lot of time doing this, and I'm delighted. And I want to find questions that I don't have the answers to, so we can go out and work out how to solve and ask them for you. So thanks, everybody. Wish you all a very, very happy day or evening or wherever you are. Great. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, as you'll see in the chat box uh, just there, Stuart has uh, very helpfully posted all this is email. Again, so uh, give them a shout. And obviously, you know, we've got, uh, what, I think 12, 12 days left on the CrowdCube campaign. So, uh, you know, help us spread the word, uh, post it on your social, send it to friends. Uh, if you've got any other uh, questions that come up, uh, obviously just send us, uh, send us an email. Uh, we've also got Stuart, um, Stuart's put all his phone numbers up there so you can bug him as much as uh, you want. Uh, also, obviously, on the CrowdCube page, we have a whole other Q&A section with um, a bunch of other questions. Uh, if you want to go through and see anything else there, obviously, anything that comes to mind, feel free to post it there as well as email it. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. hope it was informative. I'm going to thank Phil for uh, staying up and, and joining us uh, over in Australia. Thank you, Aldous. And thank you all for attending. Uh, and, yeah, keep in touch. Bye, guys.